From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, I'm Carla Gonzalez and this is From the South. We start in Brazil where the Senate approved a decree on Tuesday that authorizes army generals to take over Rio de Janeiro's security. The decree was approved with 55 votes against 13, but the details of the plan still need to be finalized. The move is aimed at curbing violence driven by drug gangs. This is the first time the armed forces have been put in charge of law enforcement since the end of the two-decade military dictatorship in 1985 and it has generated widespread debate among, among lawmakers and critics. But the government says invoking the help of the army is necessary. In Rio de Janeiro's urban reality, you often go out with an arrest warrant to a house in the community, and the bad guy moves. So we need to have mass arrest warrants, which has been done on other occasions. We need to go back to work that is more efficient, developed for both the military and the police. And Peru's former dictator Alberto Fujimori may be back in court soon. A Peruvian judge decided he could be tried for killings in the 1990s, despite a pardon by the Peruvian president. With the humanitarian pardon granted by President Pedro Pablo Kuczynski, as well as the application of a statute of limitation, Fujimori had been excluded from all judicial pending process. However, the judiciary decided to nullify that and to try Fujimori for the torture and execution of six peasants north of Lima, known as the Petivilica Massacre in the year 1992. My son-in-law was tortured, burned, shot. I woke up desperate. My God, I said, what's happening? What happened? They were already unconscious and they could not speak at all until we went to see them. We have had them covered in a house. All six. We have buried the six. In the Petivilica massacre case, the prosecution is pre-requesting a 25-year jail sentence for Fujimori and the payment of a civil reparation of $150,000. They are trying him as being directly responsible for a crime against humanity. The presidency of the republic approved a policy that had to do with the creation of death squads, in this case which were given resources. All the facilities, all the logistical devices, the personnel, it was all approved as well as administration in order to carry out these crimes. These murders of select targets, they were also given guarantees of impunity. For progressive politicians, this will not just be a blow for Fujimorismo, but also for President Kisinski. They assured that the recent judicial resolution demonstrates that the statute of limitations granted to the dictator in last December was not for humanitarian reasons. They demonstrated that this was part of a negotiation. Second, it's been demonstrated that it was unconstitutional because the man was a violator of human rights. The political agreement has been confirmed. The indignation of this process is that Pedro Pablo Kuczynski negotiated his stay with the release of a convict. For now, human rights organizations and families of the victims of former dictator Fujimori continue to wait as the Inter-American Court of Human Rights determines whether or not to grant Fujimori the statue of limitations or whether he should return to jail. And political violence continues in Colombia. The latest victims, a social leader who was killed in the north of Santander and an indigenous leader who survived an attack in the Cauca department. 33 social leaders have been killed in 12 departments across the country in 2018. According to Carlos Espitia, researcher for the In the Past Institute, the national governments denied the political violence behind these attacks. Local authorities tend to deny the reality. They say that the victims had other kinds of issues and hide the role he or she had in the defense of human rights. Ten FARC former fighters and militants have been killed during this time period. These figures show a deep humanitarian crisis. Since the signature of the peace agreement, 49 former fighters have been murdered, and since January 2016 till today, 
political violence has put an end to 322 social leaders' lives. Citizens are wondering what kind of democracy is the Colombian one? We are proud to say that we have the oldest Latin America democracy, but what we have today are terrorists, where terror is not a state, and when it arrives, it just becomes another aggressor. Social movements are asking the Colombian state to guarantee the activists' safety and to stop stigmatizing social leaders who have been signaled as local enemies during decades. National security has been based on the local enemy elimination. Anyone who disagrees with the state has been killed. If this policy is not reevaluated, there is a high risk for the survival of the peace process. The upcoming elections for the Congress and the presidency of the Republic deepen the latent crisis. There are no guarantees for the victims nor for the former fighters to assure their political participation. Colombia will be deciding in the upcoming days what kind of democracy it wants to become. A real one that accepts dissent or just one paper on paper. In Venezuela, the launch of the state's cryptocurrency, the Petro, has gathered widespread interest among investors. Visits to the Petro web portal surged 500% on Tuesday, the first day of its pre-sale. That translated into $375 million in orders. Our correspondent in Caracas, Freddie Gillingham, tells us more. The University of Medical Science in Caracas hosted a very special briefing for its young practitioners, just in time for the launch of Venezuela's commodity-backed cryptocurrency. These students got a last-minute lesson on how it works and why it will be of particular importance to them. The Petro seeks to open new doors in economic sovereignty and circumvent economic sanctions that threaten the livelihoods of all of these young students. With foreign-imposed sanctions preventing Venezuela from paying off vital debts, a huge strain has been put on the importing of medicines, leaving these students worried for the future and reliant on an alternative. Breaking with the hegemony of the dollar, we can do transactions as person or as a government, to guarantee the primary materials so we can deliver medicine to our people. Venezuela's president, Nicolas Maduro, announced the economic move only two months ago. His government have been at the brunt of what they call an economic war waged by Washington and some of its allies. Debt refinancing has become almost impossible under current conditions, but the Petro seeks to overcome this financial blockade. Our major partners and commercial allies are interested to participate due to the oil. OPEC is interested in creating a cryptocurrency for commercial oil exchange. This is a tendency. We don't have to be afraid of it. This is a revolutionary way of payment. We are eliminating the intermediaries, destroying the financial monopolies and oligopolies dominated by the United States. On the other side of the capital, a facility is being set up to serve as a crypto farm, a regulated legal space which will mine the new digital currency. This is one of many newly launched farms across Venezuela that will serve as the backbone to this new initiative. Venezuela's economy needs a lifeline, and the Petro may be just that. Paving the way for financial and economic independence, this step could well set a new trend for other countries to follow in the future. Freddie Gillingham, Telesaur, Caracas. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting.
this day and age when someone can get away with killing somebody. When someone can get away with saying, I accidentally walked to the storage room, the storage shed. I accidentally grabbed the gun out of the storage box. And then I accidentally walked back to the car. And then I accidentally raised my arm in level with the late, late Colton Bushy's head. Then my finger accidentally pressed the trigger. What a bunch of garbage. We continue praying that something is done and that we could go home and tell the people that we tried hard and we're still going to keep trying and we're going to keep going and this ain't going to stop until something changes for the better. Welcome back. Three independent candidates are set to shake up Mexico's coming presidential elections by challenging the nominees of the traditional parties. And the strongest of the three is former First Lady Margarita Zavala, the wife of former President Felipe Calderón. Our country is tired and that is why I'm opening up this path. I know that millions of Mexicans have found out about the politicking of the political parties, the money mixed up with politics and power. Currently, Andrés Manuel López Obrador of the Morena Party is leading the polls with 27 percent. The independent candidates are not expected to win the elections, but they could take 8 percent of the votes and shift the balance in the election. All together, we all can win against the system and show who calls the shots. It's the citizens. We know we are going to have economic difficulties. The media won't be with us and we won't have access to free information as set out in electoral law. We will continue on regardless to show that we can communicate with each voter in Mexico. It is the voter who decides. Grenadians will be heading to the polls on March 13. Prime Minister Keith Mitchell is hoping to once again win the mandate of the people. Commentators say the vote could be a close call. Well, the communities, they are very split. Um, some, they are very adamant that their party, which is the NMP, will be successful in the elections. Others believe that, based on the work that the NMP has been doing, that they should not be elected for another term in office. So one will have to wait and see come March 13th who would be successful in the elections. In Bolivia, demonstrators are on the streets protesting both for and against the potential re-election of President Evo Morales. Our correspondent in La Paz, Freddy Morales, reports. The government and the opposition are set to face each other on Wednesday, February 21st. With dueling demonstrations on the second anniversary of the referendum, the opposition won by a small margin, which asked if the constitution could be partially modified. The referendum was backed by social organizations in support of the government, hoping to allow President Evo Morales to run for re-election in 2019. The government claimed that the loss of the referendum was due to a well-orchestrated web of lies that involved the president's private life. Two years later, the Constitutional Court permitted President Morales to be part of the ballot, an act that has caused the opposition, which now includes commonly progressive sectors, to call for a national strike and the close down of roads. The call also suggests that people occupy streets to close them down. Social organizations in support of the government have also called for demonstrations around the country in support of Morales' candidacy. Both sides have instructed their followers to avoid confrontations. Freddy Morales from La Paz. The Dominican Republic is hosting an international seminar on regional integration in Latin America and the Caribbean. The seminar was attended by scholars, philosophers, and political analysts from the region and Europe. They look back at lessons to be learned from the European Union's experience, as well as existing regional blocs in Latin America and the Caribbean, such as CELAC and PetroCaribe. In this seminary, we were discussing improving unity and integration between the people and nations of Latin America and the Caribbean is a legacy of Chavez. Thanks to his work, which effectively helped create ALBA, 
Telesur, UNASUR, Banco del Sur, and all of the other work that came from his experience, from his struggle, that were born from his ideas in which we now have the responsibility of developing more concretely. Hugo Chavez was a great humanist, a sensitive politician, a man who loved culture in all its different forms, a leader who understood his people's deepest desires. He devoted his life to create a big united motherland by creating new institutions such as UNASUR, PETROSUR, Banco del Sur, and so on. For that reason, Chavez is one of the biggest names in Latin American history, an extraordinary leader who made emancipation possible. So I only have wonderful memories of Chavez, and I was really lucky to share moments with him. In Antigua, the government is increasing efforts to improve health care by building polyclinics in areas currently without hospital facilities. Health Minister Malwin as Joseph said, there are plans to build more polyclinics at a later date. The facilities will be funded by grants from the People's Republic of China. Strategically locating polyclinics in areas where there's a long distance from the communities up to, into St. John's to go to the Mount St. John Hospital. So, People from uh, Freetown, people from Newfield, people from Pierce Village, and so on. If the illness can be managed at the polyclinic, then there will be no need to go to Mount St. John. So the polyclinics will be an upgrade of the community clinics. One person has been killed and another eight hospitalized in clashes with police during an eviction in Villa El Salvador, a coastal district on the outskirts of Lima in Peru. 21-year-old Juan Cumpa Atarama died in the hospital from his injuries. Dozens of police officers used tear gas to disperse the crowds and shielded themselves from rocks. The group is accused of squatting in the area, but they claim that the land had been untouched for 12 years and was full of rubbish. We have no weapons, we have nothing. We are armed with stones and sticks, nothing more. What have the police done? The police have come to kill us. Mexican authorities are investigating whether the police are involved in the disappearance of three Italian citizens. The three men went missing on January 31st after being detained by police at a gas station in the western state of Jalisco. Nothing has been heard from them since. Family and friends of the three men demonstrated in Naples over the weekend demanding action from the Mexican government. Mexico is facing a surge in violent crime with more than 25,000 killings last year. Authorities say they are looking into the matter but defended the delay in the investigation. When they initially reported the disappearance, we were told they were tourists, that they were on vacation, and that delayed our investigation. Why? Because we didn't have that lead into the investigation, that they were not tourists, but they were actually selling some sort of goods instead. Organizations in Argentina which fight for legal, safe and free abortion started a campaign on Twitter and are organizing a handkerchief protest in front of the Congress. It's part of the activities planned before International Women's Day on the 8th of March. Hundreds of adult and young women gathered to ask the Argentine parliament to open a discussion about the voluntary interruption of pregnancy project. Legalization is what really gives women access to the most basic health rights, which are denied by the state, and this is a form of violence. Women should be able to decide about their bodies, what they want and what they can do in certain circumstances. Protesters call for a division between church and state because they believe that religion is the only obstacle in approving this law, which has been presented seven times since 2007. How can the health minister look away when this is the main cause of maternal death here? How can he ignore us when there has been more than 60,000 abortions, regardless of what the law says? He must look for a solution. If not, a lot of young and poor women will keep dying or getting injured because of unsafe underground abortions. There are 60,000 patients each year. 
This is not right. This is a public health problem. Feminist leaders assured that this is also a social justice issue because it affects mainly the most vulnerable women. There's a lot of hypocrisy in this. There are women who have the resources, and for them, an abortion is not a problem, nor something they can't get. But without legalization, it is looked at as something shameful. There are complaints regarding legal abortions in Argentina. There are problems with access to contraceptive methods, and sexual education has been censored. <laughs> On the 8th of March, they will mobilize once again for the right to safe, legal, and free abortions, and will also ask for public policy to prevent and fight violence against women. They will be present in all the plazas of Argentina. In Bermuda, lawyers are appealing to the Supreme Court against a law prohibiting same-sex marriage. Attorney Mark Pettingill presented the appeal in the name of a Bermudan citizen who plans to get married in the future. On February 7th, the governor of Bermuda, John Rankin, signed a bill that reverses the legalization of same-sex marriage. That's despite a verdict issued last year by the Supreme Court approving it. The Vatican investigator Archbishop Charles Cicluna has arrived in Chile to hear the testimonies of sexual abuse victims. Chicluna met with several witnesses as part of the probe into Bishop Juan Barros. Barros is accused of covering up crimes against minors perpetrated by his former mentor, Father Fernando Caradima. One of the victims said he was hopeful his testimony would bring the truth to Pope Francis. His role in a previous investigation helped convict Caradima in 2011. In truth, we always have a certain level of trust, otherwise we would not be here. Our duty as Chileans and individuals, as any self-respecting person, is to collaborate regardless of the process of investigation for truth and justice. We'll take one last short break. Join us after a look at what our multimedia team is reporting. Welcome back. Now let's have a look at some other stories from around the world. Fighting between armed rebels and Syrian forces has intensified in Ghouta in eastern Syria. Pro-government forces are trying to retake the last major rebel stronghold. Reports say more than 200 people have been killed. In another development, pro-Syrian government fighters enter the region of Afrin on Tuesday to support the Kurdish militia, which has been under attack by Turkey. They were reportedly fired upon by Turkish forces, risking further military escalation between the two countries. A day after young students in Washington, D.C. protested at the White House against the shootings in the U.S. and the death of 17 students in Florida school, President Donald Trump said that he has signed a memorandum directing the Attorney General to propose legislation that would ban all devices that turn legal weapons into machine guns. While speaking from the White House, Trump said he's ready to take action. We must actually make a difference. We must move past cliches and tired debates and focus on evidence-based solutions and security measures that actually work 
and that make it easier for men and women of law enforcement to protect our children and to protect our safety. The office of the U.S. Vice President Mike Pence has said that the North Korean officials canceled a secret meeting scheduled between Pence and the North Korean leader's sister Kim Yo-jong and the nominal head of the state Kim Yong-nam. The meeting was supposed to take place in South Korea during the Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang on February 10th, but was called off by North Korean side just two hours before the meeting. Six people have been killed in an attack on a police station in the small South African town of Nakobo. The attackers also stole scores of weapons and a vehicle. Five police officers and two soldiers were killed in the attack. South Africa's police minister has called the incident a national tragedy, describing the murders as brazen and horrifying. And finally, Afro-Colombian communities celebrated Black Christmas in the village of Quinamayo in West Colombia over the weekend. As part of the annual celebration, a black doll represented the baby Jesus is carried through the town in a colorful procession. The tradition dates back to the days of slavery, when slaves were not allowed to celebrate Christmas because they were busy working during the festive season. So they moved the event to February where they could celebrate it. And we've come to the end of this morning news brief. This and other stories, you can find them on our website at telesurtv.net slash English. You can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Telecero English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Thank you for watching. Our actions have an impact on the environment.